this evening, Dr. Ricardo Guthrie will be uh, leading us in um, this summary and uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Guthrie. Oh, good early evening and afternoon to those of you who are with us. Um, I just wanted to say um, I've been at the Northern Arizona University for the last 12 years, came here in 2008, right before the housing collapse. And I think that uh, much of what we're going to talk today relates to that whole idea that in the midst of turmoil and crisis, there still is a community, a beloved community that will thrive and survive regardless of the obstacles that we face. Um, so. I was just going to introduce myself as uh, by that, and then did we want to ask other people to talk at this time, uh, Reverend Lewis? Um, if there uh, is there anyone, Sister uh, Kara, do you have anything that you would like to share with us before we officially get started? Uh, no, just to thank everyone again for being here this evening. I will note, um, just because of the number of folks that we have here today, we will not be breaking into breakout rooms for our discussion. We'll just stay as one group. So uh, throughout uh, Dr. Guthrie's presentation, as you come up with questions, feel free to pose them at the end of his presentation, and then we'll launch right into our discussion with the facilitators. So Dr. Thanks. Guthrie, I hand it right back to you. All right, excellent. So I appreciate that. And again, uh, thank you all for being in here in the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the Zoom uh, partition that we've become so used to. Um, I'm hoping this helps facilitate our engagement. And again, I appreciate those who are covering time and distance to be with us. So we've titled this talk, Race, Space, and Segregation. And I added the words in the historic South Side particularly because it talks about the history of segregation as part of the African-American experience. It doesn't mean that other people weren't segregated, but it does mean the laws, the policies, and the practices are based on race, and specifically on racial groups who are considered African-Americans, Afro-Americans, Negroes, et cetera. We say Blacks these days, or Africana, or African diaspora, but we all know who we're talking about. Um, and so, the specific idea here is that there's a type of uh, desegregated experience that we're experiencing now. And I don't think it means exactly what we had hoped. It doesn't mean that the elimination of segregation means now that we're free. It just means a different form of segregation, I'm afraid. So I do use that word desegregated still more than uh, 60 years after the official end to segregation in Flagstaff. And so I'll just tab through this discussion, and then afterwards I'll share with you my, um, my policy paper if, if uh, that will help with the discussion. Okay. So you all have passed by the Murdoch Center um, at different times, or if you haven't, then let me introduce to you the idea of the Murdoch Center being the former location of a segregated school called the Paul Lawrence Dunbar School. And on this wall, we see some of the heroes and sheroes who have helped develop that community and turn it from an era of being segregated and discriminated against into a, an area of congregation and of success. And those are just some of the, the heroes and sheroes on the wall that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, again, I'm using Southside, the area south of the tracks as my uh, focal point because that is the largest area where African-Americans have resided historically. And so why would we talk about segregation as if it's a good thing? Well, George Lipsitz, one of my mentors who's done sociology and history says, when we try to express ourselves, wherever we may be, we use the type of culture that we have available to us to create a new memory, even in the midst of despair or segregation or discrimination. And so this mural is dedicated to that idea that if we work together and express ourselves, tell our story, no matter how good or how bad, we actually find a way out of no way. And we transform these spaces into real places, right? Space is the empty vacuum of places where we reside. So race, space, and segregation describes that emptiness that we're now filling with possibility. And one of these ways was using a mural and a street signs that the people of the neighborhoods in the South Side said, we need to be able to define ourselves by that place 
and not just the empty vacuum south of the railroad tracks. So what is the south side? It is the home to where most black people lived for most of the 20th century. And still we have that legacy today. And on that south side venue, we have the experience uh, shown where people lived, where they worked at the lumber mills, um, the different racially colored hands that linked together because we had blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and whites all living south of the, uh, the railroad tracks um, and working together. Um, so when I was developing this, uh, this uh, issue statement, um, I mentioned that uh, Flagstaff does have a documented history of redlining in which the banks and the, uh, the city uh, circumscribed the neighborhoods where Blacks lived so they couldn't get the access to the loans and to the financial support they might need from the city or from private business. And so that was called redlining. And it made it very difficult then to build your own home, to uh, grow in advance uh, using the financial uh, resources that were typically reserved for other people who were considered full citizens. Even veterans experienced redlining um, based on the color of their skin. So there's a documented history of that in Flagstaff. And there were other socioeconomic practices and policies which created a pattern of segregation and discrimination against Blacks and other peoples of color within the city. And again, this is just not, okay, well, I'm gonna be in the same neighborhood as my black friend or my family, or I'm Asian, so I like to be with other Asians, or I'm Hispanic, I like to be with other Mexicans, et cetera. No, that's not segregation. That might be group cohesion and enclaves, but segregation is a policy of discrimination, which said you will be separate and therefore unequal. Not just that you have your own neighborhoods, but that neighborhood will not have the finances or the resources the rest of the city has. So it's a very important piece to say, because people say, why do you self-segregate? Why do you all eat in the same lunchroom or go to the same restaurant? It's not that. That's something else that we'll talk about. So this history of redlining and discrimination against Blacks actually helped the city because while you were underserving Blacks in the South Side, you could use that money north of the tracks to build up the downtown, to give to other people who were building their own homes and their businesses. So growth and development that occurred as a result of racial exclusion and segregation during much of the 20th century were contributing factors to the erasure and the lack of representation of Blacks within the city proper. It didn't mean that Blacks were unhappy south of the railroad tracks. They had their churches, they had their schools, they had their work sites, they had their homes, they had each other. That was all there. That was all very true. But the reality was some of the factors meant that you could then ignore them because they were south of the border, or south of the railroad tracks, excuse me. You could ignore them from the city services and the other representations on the city council and elsewhere because they were in the south side. And it may not have been of more than 15 or, or, or uh, 10,000 people at a time during most of the 20th century, but it was a cohesive um, community that did not have adequate representation. I think there was one black policeman at the time. Um, and he was there to ensure that people didn't go north of the border, uh, north of the, uh, the railroad track. Um, so the absence of black culture and the historical structures outside of Southside is a continuing problem because this lack of visibility leads to planning and policies that fail to address the impacts of those policies on African-Americans. And it also undermines their contributions overall. So Flagstaff demographics, as you know, in, indicate a growing segment of Native Americans, of Lat Latinx, Mexicans, Hispanics, of growing Asian American populations and African-Americans. So if whites were at 90%, they might be down to 65% with larger numbers of Native Americans, Hispanics, uh, Asians, and then Blacks. And so officially we might say it's 2% or 3% of Blacks and then another 6% two races or more than one race of which some will be Black as well. And I just wanna uh, indicate that borderline of 2% or 3% of Blacks is generally what we say is where the Black community is. And you know, though, their pockets are much larger um, in the South Side and Sunny Side and, um, and the areas that we're going to talk about. 
And it's also larger on campus, by the way, um, the percentage of African Americans within the student population. So these demographics have been used to say, well, since you're not here, you don't deserve the services anyway. What are you complaining about? Well, the reality is the work that the people did for the lumber mills, for the restaurants, for the businesses were far out of proportion to their numbers. They always were. Um, and we've talked about this earlier during some of our presentations, black lumberjacks and lumber mill workers, Mexican lumberjacks, Native American lumberjacks, they were far out of proportion to the rest of their population. They inundated those work sites and um, they would have populations again, like 20 or 30% where in the rest of the city was far less than that. So now we're here in the Flagstaff area. We work at the university, we work in the medical center, we work in the private sector and entertainment or hospitality industries. But growth overall has remained stagnant because there is a lack of jobs. There are fewer affordable and adequate housing available for our growing populations and limited cultural opportunities for people of color. Um, we're very proud of our, some of our business owners uh, who will take care of your haircuts, right? Uh, like uh, Mr. Cuts, uh, we're very proud of that to be able to do that. But what does it say yes, when there are few barbers available, right, in this city? that you might have to go to Phoenix or Tucson or, or LA to get your head done if you can't get into Mr. Cuts. What does that say? It means there's a lack of opportunity. Um, and then for him, that means a greater chance to expand his business because there's a great demand for that. But at, adequate housing is not here. Limited culture opportunities. And segregation as a thematic construct, a way to devise and describe our lives really does talk about the built environment in ways that are, like I say, positive in many ways that are negative. It's an underexplored aspect of this small mountain town, you know, less than 80,000 people, that's pretty small, that seeks to embrace growth and change. And so as I go through this discussion, when we get a chance to open up and talk more, I'm gonna talk about, I'll try to keep it to five points, okay? The legacy of segregation. And if you're taking notes, I'm saying segregation as a legal construct and a social custom construct. The legality, de jure, and the social construct, de facto, they both work together and they are just as strong. Just because you can't see a law on the books doesn't mean that people already know how they should treat you based on the unwritten laws. So the his history of segregation will be approached from a pro and con perspective. Uh, two, growth and development within these demographic shifts. It's very clear that Arizona is going to be a majority Latinx population state by 2025 or 2030. I mean, we may already be there because of undercounts. And as a result, those demographic shifts will affect how you elect a governor, who you have in the legislature, and yes, it'll affect little old Flagstaff as well, even if we don't grow past 100,000 or 110,000. I mean, we probably will. But right now, the demographic destination is Latinx people becoming the majority in the state. And if you think there'll be a shift in power, you're darn right, there will be. But the question is, will there be an electoral system that will allow that to happen so that little old Flagstaff and other areas can then benefit from it as well? We'll wait and see. So growth and development within these demographic shifts is number two. Number three, we know this, the relocation of the Rio de Flag. That flag um, uh, river floods on a, I guess they say a 90 year uh, cycle. And we say it's often more often than that, but when it floods, it inundates the south side and makes it very difficult then to develop in the area without having proper insurance. And so when the Rio de Flag is relocated, and it will be relocated, that's going to affect Southside in very tremendous ways. The good thing will be then you will be able to develop your house. The bad thing is it might be more expensive than you probably can afford. Uh, but it has to happen and it will happen. And so number three is when the relocation of the Rio de Flag goes down, will the people here be able to benefit from that? Or if you wanna do it in a positive way, how will people be able to benefit from it? I think I like that approach better. Number four, Northern Arizona University. That's our big neighbor. 
Um, and so what does NAU have to do with neighborhood empowerment? I think it could play a positive role. Um, remains to be seen, but I think it's part of the one of the elephants in the room <laughs> in terms of what the future of a society that is trying to overcome segregation will look like in Flagstaff. And then number five, again, I'll just try to keep it to five, the city itself. The city of Flagstaff and its resource allocations can sway depending on who you have in office, right? You can have a mayor and a city council who are working in conjunction to empower communities, or you can have a mayor and a city council who are at odds and make it very difficult for the neighborhood empowerment to develop. So I'll talk more about that when we get to the end of the discussion, but those last um, two segments, the NAU and the city are the two big elephants in the room, I would say, as we move forward. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next piece here. The context for what we're talking about, these are numbers from 1990 and they really haven't changed too much. There's some increase in population, obviously, but in terms of the percentages that we see here, this still remains true. And this is a direct outcome, legacy of segregation. The neighborhoods that we're talking about, and this again is a, not all of Flagstaff, but it's close enough. Sunnyside, Southside, which is broken into three areas, Plaza Vieja, which really deserves its own location, and Pine Knolls. Well, we consider part of that the, the, the greater, let's call it greater Southside. And as a result, you can see these numbers are just off the charts. 81% of the folks in Southside were part of this low to moderate income which is about just about $11,000 compared to the rest of the city, which is twice that, or almost three times that, 28,000. Um, the median home value in Southside, as you can see, it's 64,000. This is from 1990, again, it's much more now. Um, but again, that's still um, not the same percentage across where Flagstaff is. And if you go down the, the, the charts here, you'll see um, Southside of Plaza Vieja and Pine Knolls, similar problems in terms of this gap between what's happening in the rest of Flagstaff compared to here. And again, part of this is the lack of salary jobs that would allow you to make $28,000 in 1990 time terms. It's increased now. Again, I have to keep saying that, but still there is a gap. And these are part of the wealth gaps that we'll talk about later. And I think Mr. Lumpkins talked about this earlier when we had a, a previous presentation. So the low income concentrations, again, a distinct legacy of segregation, one of the negative uh, uh, outcomes. But also, let's look where the people of color live. Same thing. There are more African-Americans in Southside, 7.2%, or Plaza Vieja, 5%, or Pine Knoll, 21%. Those are a lot of folks over there in the Cogdale Recreation Area. 21%. Uh, and again, these numbers are not um, large in terms of the overall city since we only have like 70,000 70, people more or less. Um, but these are uh, percentages that we have to pay attention to because when you say and you think of who black people are and where they are, these are the numbers that strike you. 7% um, compared to 3% for the rest of the city or 2% is what um, we've been told. Um, Native Americans are, um, definitely have higher percentages and so do Hispanic or Latinos. Um, and then the other, this is the category I like to look at, the other category is one race or two, two races or, um, or, or more, or biracial people. So if I'm black and Latino, I might be in the other category, right? I may not count as black, but when I do my census, I put black first. I don't put the Hispanic first because then they ask you, well, what race are you? And then you get split. So that's my strategy to increase the numbers for African-Americans, but not everybody does that, right? This current generation will say, well, I'm other, I'm two or more. <laughs> and therefore you go into the other category and the black is an undercount. Oh, I show up at work today, people will look at me, well, what are you? What are your pronouns? And my pronouns will be black, Hispanic, mixed race, that's what will happen. Um, so I just want to say that 2% uh, officially, but if you look at that other number, there's 8% or more who are other. And I'll bet you half of those people are black. That's just my, my guess. 
So here's a legacy of segregation, I would say on the positive side, where the people of color live still are condensed into the south of the Route 66. Um, and this south of the Route 66 or south of the tracks, as I mentioned, we could call that the south side, which has the linked uh, racial and ethnic uh, diversity. It has a, a name and a nomenclature south side, which is very, very common throughout most of the communities around the nation. In Chicago, there's a huge south side. <laughs> Milwaukee, there's a huge south side. It's either south side or east. I'm not sure why. East St. Louis, east Palo Alto. Um, you're either south or to the east. Figure this out. Um, and right above that, there's a, a 10 or 12 different institutions, in, starting with the South Beaver School and the Dunbar School within the south side and the four black churches, um, the Basque Tourist Home up on South San Francisco Street, NAU, of course, right in the center of things. As well as our lady hey, turn that down, sir. Thank you. Uh, our Lady of Guadalupe, I had some theme music going there. And the Arizona Lumber and Timber, there were three or four different lumber mills in town. And when those jobs disappeared, it put a hurting on the south side and sunny side in Plaza Vieja. Um, and then right above that, I mentioned the heroes and sheroes. Some of these folks worked at the Dunbar School, such as Tilda Johnson um, and others who created uh, preschools like uh, Mother Hickman and then others who became heroes and sheroes like uh, Joan Dorsey, who became one of the first flight attendants um, for American Airlines and uh, TWA, um, has a very good storied history. And uh, if you ever give her a chance to talk with her, uh, you'll, you'll find that out. And then the, the men in the middle, uh, Wilson Riles, who came from here and was just a lumberjack before he became the uh, principal of the Dunbar School and then went on to uh, Fortune in California as an instructor of education. And then Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was a poet laureate who could write in any genre at the turn of the century for whom dozens of schools across the country were named. So the south side of the track, that historic south side has this legacy, which is very powerful and productive. And as we mentioned before, if you look across the city, you won't find any other site that has black faces in high places. Why is that? Um, well, it's because this, the South Side, once it desegregated, it split people up and sent people um, wherever they wanted to go. So Wilson Riles in the middle here, and then on the left, Sturgeon Cromer, the superintendent of, of the uh, Flagstaff school system said, look, we're going to desegregate before the federal government does it for us. So they got together, and by 1952, they had worked out a plan but instead of implementing it immediately, they went and talked with the black teachers and the Latino teachers and said, look, how are you gonna be affected by this? Because we're gonna desegregate. That means we're gonna close your school. And they were like, well, we won't have jobs because of the rest of the city, they won't hire us. So they said, if you're concerned about that, we'll see if you have jobs. And so they took another year to make sure that all those teachers were going to be retained so that when the students left and the schools were closed, that they could still have jobs. And they did this the year before the Supreme Court desegregated schools across the country. Um, but again, it took a year for Flagstaff to get it together. Flagstaff, aside from education and jobs, is in the uh, flood zone, as I mentioned. Um, once the Rio de Flag gets relocated, things will be improved, um, but insurance will go up because now you'll have a chance, I mean, we'll go down rather, because now you have a chance to rebuild outside of a flood zone. So here's a picture from 1983 that shows the runoff from the Rio de Flag during a, 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 a high rain period. Um, the geography of race and place still continues. Again, now it's no longer a vacuum of space, but actually a location where people call home. Um, here's the blank slate before that mural was painted. And I'd like to say that this is the type of blank slate that we should embrace that we can put our own destiny in outlines and work forward from here. Because if we don't, then someone else would do it for us and who knows what that picture would look like, right? Um, the South Side specific plan is very much a model for how we can talk about this in a way that's productive. There may be complaints, there may be some, some concerns, but here is a location where people could go 
to explain themselves and what they wanted to see the city do. And here's from the preamble, the Southside community and the city of Flagstaff will work in partnership to ensure that the city's growth and development will recognize the value and the contributions of Southside to the history of Flagstaff. And then they go on to talk about how that will do. Pretty groundbreaking stuff. And over a two year period, they had numerous meetings and discussions and town halls with people very similar to this before COVID. And they took all those ideas together. So I'm hoping we can use that plan as an idea. It's a wealth of knowledge that we can use. Um, and out of that plan, as I mentioned, let me see if I can get to specific things that come there. I try to keep it down because it's a two volume thing and it's very hard for us who are not geographers and city planners to plow through all that. So I like to tell stories and here's the story. Southside has a high density residential area. It is zoned for residents, it's, it's, a, it's pretty high. But there are other zoning elements for um, businesses and for planning. There are no parks. So when, the, when we go through this neighborhood plan and we talk about race, place and segregation, that's one of the things we wanna look at. High density residential means that you can then have individual homes and multifamily homes. It doesn't mean that you have to have projects, right? Um, but that's when we think of high density, that's what comes to mind. Um, but affordable housing should be a goal of that as well. Um, and we can talk about how that might happen. Uh, second, partnerships to develop these city-owned properties. Yes, there are some city-owned properties within Southside that have not been uh, developed fully. And those that have been developed, I think we do have some concerns that they may not be serving the people who will be there. It seems to be attracting other people who may not be permanent residents. Um, and I'm not saying that students can't play that role, um, but many of the properties that come to be developed wind up being rental properties for the student population. And you can see what happens when you have an economic downturn. That economy goes away. So the whole idea of building Flagstaff's economy on student renting, that was a gamble. And we see the negative results of that right now in the COVID environment. Um, it's very expensive to live here. But partnerships can show us what we can do. Uh, the same is true for business development. That is a way to help secure the history of uh, uh, the future of this uh, location so that you will be able to turn a dollar within the community and it stays within the community. That would be the goal. Um, I didn't put individual entrepreneurship on there, but that's what I would do right after this business development, individual, innovative entrepreneurship. As I mentioned before, there are no parks. And so parks would have to be something that we want to include in a livable city. Uh, there will be an overpass construction that will allow there to be a connection uh, to north of the tracks. And the Rio de Flag green space will be accommodated as it's relocated. Um, but I think what we're looking at now, primarily when we think of the south side, is historic preservation of our homes and our public buildings. And the Murdoch Center can be the center of that. In fact, that's what I would recommend since there are a lot of recreation centers or schools that are active right now, it falls to the Murdoch Center. And so renovating that space can be a model for how we can renovate the rest of the city. And again, my own concern is, well, who owns that renovation? If it's still a city building, I'm not sure if we're really renovating and changing what it is that we're about. So part of that renovation has to be ownership of that space. And if you look at this plan, it doesn't quite get there, but we can get to it later when we talk about it. So Murdoch Center renovation, historic black churches and other designated sites, same thing. If you renovate those black churches, but those congregations are small and dwindling, have you really renovated the space? Do those churches get to hold onto their property? If you have 25 or 30 elders, and maybe 10 or 15 students who are there on a rotating basis, it's very hard to sustain. But there is a need and an interest and an ability to make these historic black churches and other designated sites part of a historic preservation. There's a need to that, just not to save a space and keep it empty and visit it as a museum, but actually a livable space. Okay. Um, and of course, we've talked about the South Side as not just being a space where people pass through while going to NAU or getting to downtown. The links to transportation are pretty significant 
so that the people who live in those places are not seeing their streets as just a pass through. Um, so that's what I mean by transportation and the road master plan so that Coral's uh, street where her grandfather built a home is not just where people cut through <laughs> to get to NAU. Um, all right, and of course, public improvements and the connection to the downtown center is very important because we don't just live by ourselves in these areas. As I mentioned, we're connected. All right, I'm almost done here, folks. Reimagining the future South Side. We have to address those legacies of segregation, as I said, and I do insist that it's both negative and positive. You turn the segregation and discrimination into a way of congregating and creating value and people did see value in those black churches, in those black schools, in those black homes, in the restaurants, et cetera, that inundated the area. It's still the most diverse racially and ethnic demographics in the city, but it also has the lowest wealth, the lowest income, and the lowest level of home ownership. That has to change. Gentrification pressures will always be there, right? I'm hoping the tidal wave won't wipe people out. But it has to be a reality check to say, yeah, gentrification happens despite home preservation, despite historic preservation, so on and so forth. Because why? We don't own the areas that we live to a large percentage. And that, that could be the, the prime number there. So we also have to evaluate the relationship with the city of Flagstaff. If we have a progressive mayor like Mayor Coral, what happens to the next mayor and the mayor after that? Does the relationship with the city change? Well, it shouldn't. It shouldn't matter if you have a great mayor that you love and admire or someone that you can't stand. They should still do the same job, whether you like them or not. That's what we expect. And I think that's the bar that makes it so hard to follow someone like Mayor Coral because she's established a way of relating to the city that any mayor should do. Whether you like them or not, Republican, Democrat, Independent, that's the way you should have. And so let's evaluate that relationship. Can we have the same relationship after Mayor Coral and the city changes? We shall see. Uh, partnerships, representation, and processes. How do we empower the residents and grow ownership in a big way? This Southside plan can be a model for that future engagement. I really do think that. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't say the things I wanted to say, but so what? I'm just one person. I can say it's a model. Let's look what the future can imagine for us. Business development, not just consumer enterprises, not just pizza parlors and Starbucks and uh, uh, cappuccino shops, not just consumer enterprises, but innovation where enterprise can happen. That still has to be on, on the table. Um, not just art zones where people make uh, pretty things in art lofts, but that could be part of it. Okay, there are other models in Sunnyside that we should look at and bring into the South Side. And then lastly, the two big elephants in the room, the Rio de Flag relocation and Northern Arizona University. That still has not been sorted out, if you ask me. And with the changeover in leadership, same thing. Should our relationship change with NAU, regardless of who the president is? Well, I'll leave that to you to discuss. I do have some questions that we can go through at the end of this. Um, so this is uh, the scaffolding that was built to try to do the mural and we have to do the same thing here. What's the scaffolding to build a future relationship to the city? Um, here's people from across the city, both the students as well as some of the residents and some of the, the usual suspects who have come together to work on the mural. We also have to have that for building the future in a post-segregated society. Um, I have some references here uh, that I can share with you as we go forward. Um, some of them are uh, videos that were put together over the years, and some of them have like the Southside Neighborhood Plan. It's there for you to look at. Um, and what I'll do is, um, if I may, I will, um, I wanted to uh, switch my, my viewing so that you've got a, a chance to see this better. Um, and then I'll uh, pass the baton right here. Let's see if this is it. Let's see, I'll try that again. Uh, share the screen. Live Black Experience. All right, let me 
can see. Close these down and hopefully I'm screen sharing out of this thing. <laughs> All right. Does that show up, Kara, as a the issue statement? It does. And the final version has just been shared to the chat as well. Oh, good. OK. All right, so you can follow along. This is the part that I discussed earlier on page one. Um, my references are the Southside Neighborhood Plan, the Historic Southside Mural, and the AZ Daily Sun reports. And then on the, the second page, I've got my context for low income, but that's where black folks and color people of color are. Um, and the fun facts that NAU, excuse me, Southside is still home to four historically black churches. It was the segregated neighborhood for blacks and Latinos for most of the 20th century and home to two segregated schools from the 1920s, the Dunbar School and the South Beaver School, both of which are closed. Just keep that in mind. They were neighborhood schools. There are no neighborhood schools now in, in Flagstaff, uh, Southside rather. And so my uh, key questions that I'd wanted to, to help lead through are there at the bottom. And um, what I'll do is, uh, Kara, if you let, let me know that um, people want to go through this discussion uh, individually or take their questions now. These are backups if you'd like, and we can go from there. Okay. That would be my presentation for now. Okay. And we did have just one question for you, uh, Dr. Guthrie. There was someone who asked um, if you could define the uh, Pine Knoll neighborhood. Yes. Okay, the Pine Knoll neighborhood. For those of you who um, travel to, let's say, um, um, from, um, from Northern Arizona University, going towards the, um, I want to say, uh, Whole Foods restaurant and the Grove and the location there. So you're on Butler Street, and the major crossroad that you're going to pass is uh, Lone Tree. If you turn right on Lone Tree and go down the hill, Pine Knolls is the area that is right um, below the, uh, uh, the um, they call it the Lumber Mill uh, Historic Park. Well, I guess there is a park there then. But um, it's on Lone Tree. It's uh, across from the uh, is football fields that the NAU uses. And up in this neighborhood, Pine Knolls, there are, um, there's a recreation center, I believe it's the YMCA now, and families traditionally lived there and went to Cogdill Recreation Center. Again, over 21%. So it is south of Route 66, but it's been considered its own location, Pine Knoll, uh, rather than part of Southside. And the city has designated its own historic district for Southside that separates it from Pine Knoll. Just, that's okay, just like they separated from Plaza Vieja. Um, there are connections between those people who live in Pine Knoll near Cogdill that are connected um, to South Side. That's where the, they go to the churches in the South Side. They go to schools in the South Side. So I consider them part of the greater South Side area, although they are their own community and it is heavily Black um, and uh, Latino uh, even today. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. All right. Okay. Okay. So now we are going to turn things over to our uh, facilitators Amen. who are going to guide us through the discussion questions for this evening. So for the facilitators, the, the discussion questions are in the chat for you. Um, for everyone who's participating, they're also listed there so you can see what's coming up and I will just turn it over to them. All right, well, I'll take the first question. This is uh, Edward Lumpkin uh, with 5 Day Signal Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, question number one, um, again, this is for anyone to answer. Uh, what are some of the reasons why the contributions of African Americans might not be recognized throughout the city? I will repeat, what are some of the reasons why the contributions of African Americans might not be recognized throughout the city. Anyone have a, a guess or response? One would be that um, 
because the black community here in Flagstaff is invisible and that's been an ongoing theme uh, throughout these town halls, uh, the invisibility of, of the black community here. Um, and, you know, secondly, we have to, to just be real um, for those who do know and, and do uh, have some influence uh, to, to bring to light um, that there is uh, a Black community here um, have not really taken the time to do so in spite of uh, the work that key uh, Black community members such as the very mayor of this city uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 our, our community chiefess, Ms. Deborah Harris, um, you know, professors uh, like Dr. Guthrie, um, who are out in the community, um, but still uh, no one seems to, um, and I'd like to think that Flagstaff um, is not that place that that does not care, um, that that uh, doesn't want to take an interest and in bring to light um, the the black community and the co contributions of African Americans here. Um, so those are just to me two of the foremost reasons um, to why. Uh, we have not been recognized throughout the city. Um, I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, you had mentioned uh, in your, your response uh, that the uh, African-American community is invisible. Um, explain what you meant by that, please. Your voice? I Your think voice, it's still, uh, still muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, even the smallest towns that I have been in um, throughout the nation, I could always find some place that served my food that <laughs> I'd like to eat, soul food. I could always find um, some little nook and cranny little shop that sold uh, black hair supplies and, and accessories that, that we like to wear and adorn ourselves with. And uh, there is none of that. Um, uh, so one, if, if I did not um, happen to go down this one street and see that Murdoch Center, um, I probably would never have a clue that there are any black people here or that, or that at one time there were some black people there or here. Uh, so that is what, there is nothing in the community um, in, in, and when, well, within the major community, because we can go over off of Fourth Street and, and we see Brother Cuts over there and we see the market of dreams. But usually down, a downtown area has some sort of, of indication of Black life or any of the lives that are represented within the community. So that is why I say that, that the, the Black community within Flagstaff, um, it is invisible outside of, outside of that Murdoch Center and that church, the Black historic church that sits, you know, just a few feet away from the community center. Other than that, we, we, have, we have no knowledge, no sign of, of Black lives here in Flagstaff. Well, that's very, um, uh, yes, similar to some of the responses that I'm looking at in the um, chat group. So this is a response from Dr. Moore. Uh, she adds, there are no markers or plaques to designate the contributions of African-Americans posted throughout the city. So it kind of uh, adds to your invisibility uh, response. 
Uh, there's another response from uh, Jennifer Hunter. Uh, she says, I graduated from NAU as an, um, I graduated in the U.S. as an undergrad and worked in the Riles Building as, as a faculty member in the Riles Building on NAU, and I never knew what the namesake was. Um, can anybody give us an idea of what the namesake or at least the uh, um, significance of uh, the name for that, that particular building? Does anybody know the history? Yeah, uh, this is Deb Harris. Um, I'm just wondering if we could take down the screen share so that we might be able to see the rest of the participants that have their cameras on. Thank you. That's much better. I'd much rather talk to people than to talk to a screen. And But I'm sure the facilitators have the questions in their chat. Uh, let me just say that Wilson Riles, um, the building was named after Wilson Riles. Wilson Riles was the uh, first um, Black student that we're aware of to graduate from NAU. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ted Johnson graduated years later, but uh, Wilson Rouse was the first <clears throat> Black that we're aware of, excuse me, I'm so sorry, um, that graduated from um, NAU. He was um, presented with an honorary doctorate from NAU back, I think, probably in the early 1970s, maybe. I don't have that date exactly. Um, Dr. Guthrie might have that exact date where he received that honorary doctor degree. Mm -hmm. But um, so Jennifer, don't feel bad that you did not know uh, because um, two years ago, I was speaking with the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters and the College of Arts and Letters is housed in the Riles building. Mm -hmm. And he did not know who Wilson Riles was. I would venture to bet a lot of administrators on campus do not know who Wilson Riles was um, as compared to maybe some of the other buildings that we have like um, uh, Gillenwater or um, Rose, the Rose Activity Center. People will know who those are. They're, they're all you know white men or one white woman. Roseberry Hall is named after a white female. Mm -hmm. um, and Recently, we just probably in the last 15 years, uh, the Castro building, which is SBS, uh, one of the, it used to be where the old um, anthropology building is, but that's the Castro building. So it's, it's not uncommon for people not to know who the buildings are named after and why. And so I, 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 I would say that it's probably to NAU's advantage if they would put plaques outside of those buildings so that they could know who the people are. And that would be helpful to the students. Um, but there's a lot of information about Wilson Rouse. If you go out and Google him, if you go to Klein Library uh, in the archives, there's some uh, items there. And so I would encourage people to, to do that research. And of course, we have information about him at the Murdoch Center. Does that answer the question, uh, Mr. Lumpkin? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Lumpkin, if I could just piggyback off of what Ms. Lewis um, was speaking to in, in the question, to speak candidly, I, I think that in order to acknowledge the accomplishments of the Black community um, and the resiliency of the Black community, it also means that our community in Flagstaff would need to acknowledge the fact that there were barriers to overcome in the first place, yeah. that there were things within our system and flag stuff that were oppressive that we had to overcome in the first place. And from my experience, having lived here for a little over eight years now, I don't know that the culture of flag stuff is such that we like to acknowledge that we too have a history of trauma and oppression towards the black community. Um, I, I don't know how open that conversation actually is. Um, being a university town, being a quote unquote liberal town, um, I, I think we are often hesitant in the larger community to acknowledge the fact that we too have some pretty serious transgressions towards minority populations, especially that of the black um, and, and, and our Native American brothers and sisters too in the community. And until we have that cultural shift where we cease the complacency with being a quote unquote liberal town, uh, I don't know that we will be able to acknowledge the accomplishments of the black community because we still won't be willing to acknowledge the fact that there were things that we had to overcome in the first place. Thank you for your response. Anyone else? 
I did want to note that uh, Vice Mayor Shimoni had uh, put that he had a comment. Yes, thank you, Kara. I was about to jump in. Um, wow, amazing conversation. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Adam. It's great to see you all and be here with you and, and talk, be talking about these wonderful, very important and challenging topics. And, and thank you to the facilitators and to everybody involved. Um, just a couple thoughts I wanted to share, you know, and very much like you were just saying, uh, Jermaine, you know, my notes are very much in the same line of thought, you know, of, of what I wanted to share. And that's to start with an understanding of the current situation, what it was and what it is today. And that, you know, we need to open our eyes first and, and look at, like, you know, Dr. Gun Guthrie said, this neighborhood, what, the, the well being of that neighborhood and the differences between what it was and what it is today, from when it was thriving to how it is now. And, and, and recognize that this happened and what it was. Um, and then, you know, I think it's rooted in, in respect and in respect by our leadership and our elected officials and our city, city leadership and, and working off of efforts and building upon efforts like what we have done with the Southside plan and, and taking that and, and building upon that and now taking that plan and putting it into action. And then building that community that Dr. Guthrie talked about that can thrive and, and address the topics that Bernadine and other were sharing about, you know, a thriving community that is building and growing and, and just doing all the beautiful thing that things that a community does, right? But to me, that starts with the needs of the the how the housing needs and the quality of life and the quality of living of those neighborhoods, right? So something council talked about last week, I think it was, was the parking situation in the South Side. And I at point blank asked Mayor Evans at the dais, you know, what's the issue? What's the holdup? And she goes, political will. So so I and I I made a call to action and she supported it and other council members did too. And my point is I think we have political will now moving forward at least for the next few years, <laughs> but especially in this, the upcoming year. So I think we can really do a lot in terms of getting back on the right track and then building upon that moving forward. Um, thank you, that's all I wanted to share. Good. And I just, you know, I'm just gonna follow up with uh, Vice Mayor Shimoni and some of his comments. Uh, again, this is Deb Harris with the Southside Community Association. Uh, and when he talked about political will, um, you know, I guess I'm not really sure uh, that we really have political will yet. Uh, I know that uh, some members of this current council um, might have political will, but I'm not sure that all of their colleagues share that. And I say that because we're still dealing with the issue of affordable housing and workforce housing in this community. Um, and we still have people who feel that you know, saving the prairie dogs and the sunflowers are much more important than, than providing decent housing for people like our firefighters and our teachers you know, and our uh, city workers and, and other people. And so I, I get the political will, um, Vice Mayor Shimoni, but I guess I'm not really convinced that it's there. And I don't need you to respond to that. I'm, I'm not asking you to respond to that because that's not fair to you. Uh, <laughs> but I think the same thing happens when we talk about uh, the South Side and the Black lived experience in Flagstaff. Uh, do we really have political will? Do people really understand? And, and does that new council that's coming in, do they really understand the importance of their political, you know, having political will that they stand up and do the right thing, you know. So, so it's you know it, like I said, it, it's it's hard, and and people oftentimes are more concerned about whether or not people like them, mm. whether or not they're going to re-elect them, than they are about doing the things that's right for the community. Um, and as I said to somebody the other day, it's about us, and us is all of us. Mm. I'm just not talking about us, uh, <laughs> black lived experience. I'm talking about us all of us. And so, you know, that political will, if it's one or two people that sits on the dais that has that, that doesn't do us any good because it's gonna take at least a majority of that dais to have for things to happen. And that goes, you know, I mean, that's that's right in line with what we're doing with this 
uh, Black lived experience dialogue, where we're trying to get people to dialogue, to talk about what is um, important in our community when it comes to the Black lived experience. How are we going to incorporate that population into the community so that they feel a part of it and they feel that their experiences count? So. Ms. Deb, I'll just, I want to just really quickly follow up and just say, you know, that takes all of us. And like you said, it can't just be two of us on council. We need the whole team and you all have a role in that in holding us accountable. And if you take the time to meet with us and engage with us and teach us these things that we're talking about and answer our questions and then show up to the meetings, um, it's a lot easier to hold council accountable when you're, when you're part of the conversation and you've taken the time to build those relationships. And I'm happy to talk to the team afterwards about you know, my thoughts on how to best navigate that. But um, you're right, Ms. Harris, it's, it's not easy to have a political will sometimes, but um, I, I, I feel optimistic about our plans and our goals with this group. Thank you. Well, I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll move on to uh, the second question. Um, if any of the other facilitators would like to jump in, if not, I can sort of read the the, uh, the next question. I can take it. All right. How are the legacies of segregation continued through city policies, NAU activities, and the actions of residents? Read that one more time. Sure. How are the legacies of segregation continued through city policies, NAU activities, and the actions of residents? I, I think on that one, and especially if, when you listen to Councilman Shimoni and Ms. Harris, uh, we've kind of talked about that briefly and kind of encapsulated with the, the in the first question and response. And I, I'm just glad to, 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 to hear that we're at the solution phase of this. And we're looking at how, we, we know it exists uh, and I, I, we all understand that, but, and we continue to talk about ways of, to change it. One of the things I was gonna add, I saw that Dr. Guthrie put in that he has a virtual tour. I know when I was at ASU, I was a devil's advocate. I used to walk backwards and give tours and yeah. point out all, all the buildings. It's, so if there's something similar like that at Northern Arizona University, then they could do the same thing. And we could talk to the powers to be to make sure that they're integrating that and even talk about um, portions of the campus, even sitting in the historic South Side, which was a historically segregated community. So things of that nature that it that we emphasize the importance of the, the black community and the black lived experience. So it's no longer this invisible thing. We, I think one of the things we can look at is look at whether you do it on a, a dry erase board or a focus group, ways to integrate the information into multiple conversations throughout the city and even the university. I just like I just to want to jump in there, uh, Justice. Um, what I was getting at for this question is city policies still don't recognize home ownership as a specific goal of development. It's it's on there, but it is not a major part. So if Jermaine Barkley is the minister of music, <laughs> you know, in his church, he still can't live here unless he's staying in his auntie's house or his grandmother's or whatever. He cannot own where he wants to be. He cannot be anywhere near his church. If he wants to find something, he goes out to Doney Park or Townsend, Winona or wherever, and then commutes in. Or he lives on campus and then gets kicked off because after the first year, you can't stay on campus. So the specific legacy of segregation is home ownership is less than 10%. I don't know about you, but that's not sustainable. The second thing is NAU activities also means that we're going to take over all the land all the way up to Route 66. Yes, that's part of the plan. Don't think it's not. Okay, you might say, well, they're just, you know, being benevolent. They took South Beaver. They took a parking lot. They did. It's part of the plan so that all that land becomes university land. And you could say they're a benevolent dictator, but I'll tell you what, a benevolent dictator is still a dictator. And until and unless we're able to use the city to say, hold on, zoning is not for you you won't stop that wave. That's number two. And then for the residents, we ourselves, right? I live in Ponderosa Trails. That's not Southside. 
that's not, you know, the old Flagstaff. If I were, you know, trying to make this work, then I would join with my sisters and my brothers and say, let's own a house, let's renovate something, let's do what we can do. But for now, it's like, no, well, my family lives in Ponderosa Trails, we'll pay the, that's all right. And we may not be permanent residents here. I'm really from Savannah, Georgia, right? You know, <laughs> I really can't wait to get out of this space. It's not good for me, you know? Um, but until we say, yes, it is good for me, it's Wakanda and it's right down the street and I'm gonna figure it out. We are responsible. So that's the three pieces. City policies say you don't get the grants you need, you don't get the loans you need, home ownership, that's a dream. NAU activities is we're the landlords and we're gonna do whatever the hell we want. And then the residents are like, I throw up my hands, give it to whoever wants it. Once I graduate, I'm gone. That is still the mindset. Those three determinants are far more important for changing this than the forces of gentrification, city planning, and all that. We haven't addressed those three things. And so when I say Germain, that's who I'm talking to because he's the future and I can see it, but if he wants to grow, he's got to go to a big city and leave this behind. And that for me is how we are destroying our future. Don't worry, Doc, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> right bro <laughs> i'd just like to uh chime in on that dr Dutry and, and and others i think you know the leggings legacies of segregation are continued through the silence of the community yeah. that if you look at you know we're engaging in this conversation we're reaching out to all segments and in some but we're not getting what we need to have a loud enough voice uh -huh. i really think the legacies of segregation through our complicitness and our silence of those outside of these confines in our conversations are really perpetrating and uh, uh, sustaining the legacies of segregation. So we really have to engage those outside of our comfort zone and our normal conversation zones to, to get them to be a part of this then we can start addressing that city policy because the more people that know about it, they're gonna be concerned about it and then eventually invested in it. I also think that it, it's important to highlight the fact that even beyond the practices and the policies of NAU and the university as a whole, um, as its own individual entity, just the presence of the university be belonging and, and being so close to the Southside community also draws um, a lot of urban development in the sense of new student housing being built that also displaces, um, disproportionately displaces people of color, especially because um, of the proximity to the Southside there, as well as how that causes fluctuations with home um, property values and taxes there. Um, I think as a whole, it really gets back to those three points that Dr. Guthrie was saying as to, as to how, how do we combat that? And then as um, Brother Hall was saying as well, that visibility as well, and that making sure that that voice is heard. And I'm not one of the facilitators, but I would like to hear from some of our other participants, you know, what they might think um, would be an answer to that question. You know, because I'm kind of looking at the screen, some people I know and some people I don't, uh, but I'd really be interested if they feel comfortable uh, having some comments. I'd really be interested in hearing um, what they have to say. And silence is okay. I mean, we can, we can have a few seconds of silence and it'll be all right. Give people a chance to think about it. I have a question for Dr. Guthrie. Um, can you address kind of what you see to be the relationship between segregation and gentrification? Because I've oftentimes run into it where people view gentrification as a form of desegregation. Um, so I think that, you know, it's something that uh, maybe we should also be talking about. So I was wondering if you could address that. Oh, your mic, you're muted.
there, I found the right button. I'm checking on my keyboard and it's, no. All right, so yes, I think a lot of people do say, well, you know, any development is good. And so therefore, if you care about it, then you should let it happen. And they do say, yeah, gentrification is a form of desegregation because then it allows other people who are not black or not Latino, et cetera, to come into the community. And isn't that what we want? And that's the, the question is, it's okay to have an interracial or multiracial society, but if the people who are coming in are the owners and the controllers, and you see your grandma's house being sold to them and turned into a pizza parlor, then no, that's not a, a form of desegregation that you want. But yeah, technically it desegregates, it changes the racial composition, it changes the income status, and you see bike lanes and you see pizza shops and cappuccino shops. And there's nothing wrong with those, except the fact is the built environment no longer serves that community that used to be. And it becomes this, this other thing. And again, it's so hard, Jennifer, because people do say, well, don't you want a multiracial society? Don't you want people of different incomes? Don't... Sure, absolutely. But the question is, is desegregation for whom? And we've always seen, this is my critique of the 54 Brown decision, desegregation meant closing of black schools and the taking away of black control of those spaces. I'm not gonna enshrine racism and segregation as a wonderful time, but I'll tell you what, those black schools, those black churches, those black businesses, they serve the community in ways that those who replace them do not. And so, I don't know, do we have to think about that? Um, I could be considered a gentrification because I'm from the university and I have you know, two incomes, et cetera, but I'm not the gentry. I'm not the one who's gonna take those houses away from Mrs. Sims and Mrs. You know, Mrs. Burns, et cetera. Um, but there are some people who are associated with the gentrification who will take their homes and say, well, I gave them a million dollars, so why should they be complaining? So Jennifer, you put it right in front of us. It's any development the city does that isn't cognizant of retaining community control of that is problematic. And I'll say what, if they just look at the numbers, then they say, no, we did what we're supposed to do. We're done. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm like Deb, sort of like, I want to hold on to the Murdoch Center for the Murdoch people. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to see it turned into a museum or a coffee shop. That that wouldn't be cool. So thank you for, for asking about that. I hadn't even thought of being able to explain it that way. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. But that's where that's where uh, political will comes in because we know that once the real project is completed, mm -hmm. that the housing uh, prices or the value of the homes in that area are, and the mm -hmm. land is going to go skyrocket high. And so, for those folks who uh, are still living on fixed incomes, what are we doing as a community? They own their homes in that area. We know that we're gonna fix the real. It's gonna raise the prices of taxes. So have we even started having the conversation about how do we help those residents who have lived there for the last 60 years or 50 years? Uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna have them much longer, but for the rest of the time that we do have them, how can we make you know it comfortable for them to still live in their homes and not have to sell them because now they can't afford the taxes on them. Mm -hmm. So that's where political will comes in. Um, and, and as a city, we can, we can have those conversations. You know, as a community, we can have those conversations. Yeah. And we don't know if there's something that we can do until we ask the question. And so that's where you know, the political will of our um, um, city leaders mm -hmm. uh, and our community comes in because, you know, we all have a stake in this. Ms. Deb, and to jump on that, you know, there's two ways that things get put on our agendas at council meetings. And this is how anything happens is you gotta get on the agenda, right? And the two ways that happens, so there's actually three ways. One is internally by city leadership in the mm -hmm. city in the city manager, because he ultimately controls the agendas. And so he can just put something on. The other way is through a FAIR process, which stands for the future agenda item request. And that's through the city council members. And, the, and a council member can bring an idea forward. Then there needs to be three in support and then goes on a future agenda. So like I could bring that forward. And then the last option is, is in your hands, 
which is a citizen's petition to put something on our agenda. And honestly, this is a very effective way to get our ear on any given topic. And you just need 25 signatures on this petition. That's it. It's not a big request. And, it, and then we need to address that agenda item, I believe within a month. And I, I know our deputy city manager, Shannon Anderson is on the call. And thank you, Shannon, for being with us. But um, Shannon, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's a month. Um, so we have to address it pretty quick. So those are the three ways you get an item on the agenda. And Ms. Deb, I think that's a great item to, to talk about at the city. And I think we need to have that conversation sooner than later because yeah. we need to start planning for that day because that's, that's coming. Yeah. And that's where political will, as you talked about earlier, uh, Vice Mayor Shimoni, you know, the political will, uh, yes, you know, citizens can come together and get 25 signatures and put it on the agenda. But if, if uh, city council members are hearing the same thing that I'm hearing, and this and and that political will means that you care about all of the constituents in your community because we don't run by district, we run at large. At large. And so you, uh, Mayor Evans, uh, Council Member Aslan, uh, Council Member Whalen, all of you run at large. And so this is not the first time that gentrification of the South Side has come up as an agenda item. I mean, as, as a as an issue. And so, you know, and I don't have a problem, you know, me, I don't have a problem getting 25 signatures and putting it on, trying to get it on the agenda. But it sure would be helpful if other members that sit on that council thought this was an issue and brought it forward. It goes back to, you know, segregation and desegregation, you know, gentrification, is it part of that? You know, and so, we're gonna see that. We're gonna relegate those people to somewhere else. And I'm not sure where they're gonna be able to live in Flagstaff, probably not, um, because they probably won't be able to afford to buy a home anywhere else. So anyway, I will be quiet now and let other people speak because <laughs> I really do wanna hear what other other kinds. We did have Jennifer say that she had a comment and then David, I just saw your hand go up. Um, kind of uh, two thoughts. I was thinking, you know, the way that um, sometimes um, uh, we can even unwittingly uh, displace people by moving into a community. So um, having moved into the Sunnyside neighborhood, um, which is still probably my favorite place to live in town, but um, what, what particularly happens is um, it's pretty clear that when we're putting in our applications that we're highly desired for being one high income and two being white professionals. And we lived in one place and we kind of, it, we contributed to the rent in that one townhome going up. The, the landlord raised the, the rent um, over 30%, um, over 33%, um, excuse me, and, uh, in a two year time period. Um, and, and part of that was because of us residing um, in that place. So I think there's unwittingly. So I think, you know, sometimes as, you know, I always think like, can we, how do we create a, you know, is it possible to create best practices for landlords and, and, and have a list and give awards like that? Or in some ways, will that contribute? Because then all the white people, you know, the privileged will want to go to those uh, highly rated landlords. But um, so it's something that I think about. And then two, thinking about grants for homeowners. I've always wondered if it was something possible, if it's something we could emulate in a small community where in a place like Boston, I don't know if a place like Chicago does the same thing, where they give out grants for buying homes. The, these are municipal grants. They obviously have high budgets. Um, municipal grants to either renovate a home in, in a municipality or to buy a home, but only for residents who have already lived there for a good length, let's say 10 years period mm -hmm. of time. Yeah, so people that are already you? invested in the neighborhood, because we all know like Flagstaff is a very transient city. I've been trying to make this home since 2003. I still don't know if it's going to work out. Um, so I think, you know, if looking at grants and how that works, I don't know if we already have something in place like that, but if there's homeowner grants, I think it's really important to put that kind of thing in place. And we do have a down payment assistance program for the community 
Um, I don't know all the details. I can't recite exactly the, the way it works, but that's something that we could definitely look at and see if we can improve upon it or build upon it. And ultimately that comes down to political will for funding, right, in the budget. And in this council put $200,000 towards it a couple of years ago. Um, and I think we did that same again, but um, good ideas. Yeah. yeah, I'm just worried it's people like like me that might take advantage of that, you know, and um, so the, and, and contribute to the gentrification instead of people being able to invest in their own communities that they've already long been invested in. So, but thank you, Adam. I thought David had a comment. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was waiting for uh, to see if the green light was on. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of an emotional thing. I, I've been to most of these meetings. And first of all, thank you so much for doing this. These have been powerful and just beautifully presented and so many good ideas. Um, and at the same time, I'm kind of feeling like it's this game of whack-a-mole that as soon as I begin to like wrap my head around some piece of it and think, oh, okay, we got to work on that thing. Then this other thing comes up and, oh, shoot, we got to work on this thing, which I guess is just the nature of things. But, <laughs> but it freaks me out just a little bit. Um, and and my also, I'm also concerned that there's only one more of these meetings uh, scheduled. And I, I believe Deb mentioned that there will be ongoing in-person meetings at the Murdoch. Um, so I, I feel like we're just getting a start, you know, and, and I, I want to be able to see this um, and be a part of this <laughs> continuing. And I feel like, I don't know what the word would be, but there's political will and I think there is community will maybe. And we, we've talked about, you know, this invisible community that doesn't have a sense of itself um, or as much as it needs to be able to perpetuate these, you know, questions and, and movements. Um, and what Dr. Guthrie mentioned in those three things, at some point, you know, the folks just kind of throw up their hands and say, whatever, you know, NAU is going to swallow everything. And um, so, and, I, and, and when I was working with the community, I mean, I saw that trying to get people to come to community meetings or to feel a sense of ownership and literal ownership, as you were talking about, you know, not a, you, you don't own the community that you're in for the most part. Um, so I kind of don't know, you know, it's the chicken and the egg. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we have to, you know, put some effort into creating a community presence and you have to have a community will to create that. And I just hope that this energy that's getting stirred up here will keep building because I, I feel something very strong is, is starting to happen here. Um, and I'm encouraged by that. But uh, yeah, let's hope some of that made sense. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Mr. Barnell, if you don't mind me uh, interjecting, you said, you know, it, it, every time you begin to wrap your head around, around one thing and then you say, oh, no, we have another thing to work on. Welcome to the lived Black experience worldwide. Not just Flagstaff, but worldwide. And, and when you're attempting to catch up to a race that started 400 years without you, this is, this is our dilemma. So welcome to it. But also, thank you for being a part of the conversation because Absolutely. we have to continue the conversation. And believe it or not, one of these conversations is actually going to lead to a sit down with the mayor and the council and neighbors getting involved. And before you know it, we'll have the Black, you know, the, the Buffalo Soldier Museum and we'll have revitalization in the Southside community. So, you know, it had to start somewhere. So we're so grateful the start. However, at the same time, you know, let us jump on your back and carry us to the finish line. Amen. Amen. I know we're running out of time. And I just wanted to share, you know, I, in thinking about this group coming to an end, 
to some degree, um, at least with these forums in this style. Um, I'm happy to meet with this group once a week, once every two weeks, however often this group wants to meet for an hour. And, and we can continue to take the momentum and the ideas that come from this and, and really see it through. And I think when you mix, what I've seen is when you mix political leadership and elected officials with passionate members of the public like this group, um, there's not much that holds us back. And there's a lot we can do, especially when we have um, the political will and the momentum and cultural support and community support. And I think everything we're talking about has all the above. So um, we'll talk more about that later. Mr. Shimoni, hold the presses. Uh, there is a question from Steve and Vicky Finger. I, it is, I'm not gonna even ask it. Uh, Steve and Vicky, would you please bless us with that question? So as I'm listening and as I listen to the history and I listen to the redlining, et cetera, et cetera, um, for our own community, you know, I can read about it, um, about what happens in Chicago, et cetera, but I read for our own community. What part does reparations or do reparations play for our city? I mean, I think that's a question we as a city need to look at whether we're liberal or we're, um, I can't remember who, <laughs> I think it was uh, Justice, or, or excuse me, Jermaine was talking about that. Whatever our image that is that we are trying so hard to hold on to, but what part do reparations play? Because I think they need to play, well, this is my opinion, they need to play a part. I think in a society that is built around capitalism as a stronghold and foundation, it would only be right to address the same problems within the black community with that same approach of financial liberation. Um, that's how we address all of our other major problems, right? Um, that's how we address business bankruptcy. It's how we uh, tend to address injustices for other communities and populations. Um, but the subject tends to be far more taboo uh, when it comes to financial uh, reparations for the black community. I can't express enough how enthusiastic I am that that question was even asked. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Uh, Councilman Member Shimoni, you, well, it, actually, and, and the reason why I, I preface uh, the uh, Vicky and Steve's uh, uh, question by saying your name, because that's the very thing that you were talking about in terms of wanting to listen and wanting to be engaged and figuring out some creative things. While it may not be called reparations per se, someone had the idea about if you've been living here for X amount of time, then you could qualify for this, but those types of creative ideas. And I know that that's in the wheelhouse. I see the hamster wheel running in your mind. Go ahead, please. Uh, I was gonna say, I actually have to go. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a great question and I think a great topic to be communicated and, and looked at. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely open to the idea. Um, I think that we need to really put our minds together and think about what this looks like and how, you know, we can, as a city, um, do what's best for the community and, and do what's best for the Black lived community that we have. And, 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 and yeah, move us forward in a way that is addressing and acknowledging the past with respect and, and, and integrity. You know, I'm so sick of us just pretending like everything's fine and moving forward. It's like, no, we got to look back first. And we've lost a lot of trust and a lot of credibility. And if we want to really move forward, we need to do it right. And we need to have these hard conversations and, and work together. And, and if we do that, we can reach that, you know, that promised land, so to speak. But it's going to take us all and it's going to take a lot of political will. And it's going to take a lot of engagement with you all and your patience, but yet you being effective with your engagement and, and do, being effective with your time and energy and, and communicating with us in a way that helps us get across that finish line. And, and I think we can do it on a lot of these topics and I'm open to everything. There's nothing that's off the table. <laughs> I saw it. You dropped it. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, the, before I turn it over to Kara to, to close us out, 
I just want to make sure that everybody knows all of you that have so graciously participated in these events, you all will be receiving invitations when we present our strategic plan to the city council. All of this information we're doing the in the small focus groups, we're coalescing that information so that it can feed into the strategic plan that we hope that will put us on the road to really, really shaping the future and the Black lived experience here in Flagstaff. So uh, definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. And when we present the council, we would love every single one of you to show up. And Jermaine, I don't think you can bring the, the doggy to, to the council, but I know he, he or she probably wants to come. I see him in the background. But uh, thank you guys again. And Kara, I will turn it over to you. So I'm actually going to go to Steve first, who uh, put that he had a comment, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Deb, who has some updates on uh, upcoming meetings, and then so, we'll close out. Sister Kara, before, yes. before you do that, I see two hands up. I'm not sure. Um, Prince Justice and, and, and Brother Melvin can... If, the, if they do have questions, I don't know if that was old uh, or if they do, I'd, I'd like to hear from them before we close. Please and thank you. Okay, let's go, let's go to Steve, then Justice, then uh, Mel, then Ms. Depp. Okay, well, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, Mr. Hall, you made, a I thought, a wonderful point, and that is catching up after the dominant culture has had 400 years of a head start. And, um, you know, my family is one of those families that's had a big head start because I'm white. My family's educated. And um, Vice Mayor Shimoni was talking about being generous with our time and energy. But I think there's a lot of people who can be generous with their money. Um, white people who have money want to give their money to their children. And um, there's going to be trillions of dollars that's going to be um, <clears throat> given to, uh, you know, by baby boomers, successful baby boomers. And <clears throat> I think, in a sense, this is a shame uh, to give that money to your kids, often who don't need it, who are well-to-do, well-educated, et cetera. There was just an article in uh, our Quaker uh, Friends Journal about this, and that, you know, Reparations may come from the, uh, you know, the government, but reparations can also come from well-meaning individuals. And, um, Amen. Great idea. Amen. So um, anyway, that's my comment. We'll develop a giving plan to the Southside Community Center, right? Amen. Amen. Justice and then Mr. Hall. I just wanted to thank everybody who, who chose to participate in this discussion. It's been an absolutely phenomenal discussion. Um, and I really just want to highlight um, something that Brother Brown said earlier, um, how the scope of this discussion is really taking the turn of a very, um, a very positive, progressive sort of mentality in terms of us getting in front of these issues and actually making changes for them. One specific question that I asked Dr. Guthrie I, um, earlier, and um, I'm sure that he will elaborate on it at some point, probably not in this meeting, of course, but I asked him, what are some ways that communities of color can insulate themselves from the effects of gentrification um, urban development, et cetera, et cetera. And he had many great answers. So I, I implore everybody to definitely go forth and pick Dr. Guthrie's brain. Um, and then to the point of reparations really quickly. And then um, to the point of reparations really quickly, I think it's really awesome um, that, that we can even have, um, we can even say that word because oftentimes people of color are met with um, and the common ends or, or the conversation ends as soon as that comment is made. Um, so I think that the fact that we can even have that conversation now is beautiful. And I think that we get very creative about what that might look like. I mean, reparations don't, we, I, I believe somebody echoed it earlier, but we don't necessarily have to use the, the title reparations, but that can come by way of 
um, you know, a generous donation to the Southside community. That could be a diversity and inclusion equity fund or a scholarship, you know, for, for youth of color. It can come in so many different ways. And I think that it's really cool that that conversation is being had. Thank you guys. All right, thank you all so much. This has been uh, a definitely a very interesting um, and enlightening conversation. Uh, I'm just gonna take a little uh, point of privilege here and I am going to say that there are those who have attended our um, virtual town halls uh, who are generous donors to the Murdoch Community Center and without their support over this COVID we would have definitely been in um, hot water, so to speak. Uh, and so I just want to publicly thank them because I've already privately thanked them and I'm not gonna call out their names because I know they would not want me to do that. So, uh, but they know who they are and I want them to know that we do appreciate their support um, in doing that. So thank you very much for that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, let people know is that on October 17th, and I believe that's the date, but don't write it down yet because you will be receiving an email about it. Uh, because if you signed up for these uh, virtual town halls, um, we do have the ability to collect your emails. Um, but we're uh, looking at doing um, three in-person uh, virtual town halls uh, on October 17th, which is a Saturday, I believe. We will do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and then one early evening so that people have an opportunity to pick one of those. We will have to social distance, so we will only be able to allow 25 people in each session. Uh, if we have um, an outcry that more people want to attend in person, then we will look at doing another one. Um, again, morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, so just so that you can be on, on the lookout for that. Uh, and if you know of anyone who wanted to participate but perhaps did not have the ability to do it uh, electronically, uh, would you please let them know that, they, that that will be an option? And if they do not have access to our email or Facebook page, if you could spread that word, that would be really helpful uh, to us. Um, and just so that, you know, the, the last thing I want to say is, again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who have attended. Our last session is Saturday. Uh, Mr. Jermaine Barkley will be our presenter at that time, and he will be talking about mental and behavioral health. And that's a subject that sometimes as a community, we don't want to talk about, um, but I think it's, it's critical. Um, and he will definitely share a lot of information with you uh, in terms of how these kinds of experiences and, and these things that we're talking about has an effect on our mental and behavior health. So with that, I'm going to give it back to uh, Ms. House and she can do whatever she does. <laughs> Whatever I do. <laughs> well, we just want to thank everyone again for coming out, participating in this conversation, and uh, definitely continue to invite you to keep the conversation going. Whether it is sending in comments to us by email, if it's coming out to those town halls or the, uh, the smaller group sessions that are coming up, uh, making sure you make it to the next town hall, continuing to engage with us in, the, uh, in a, a separate series that we're running, but is also very much connected to this, the Live Black Experience uh, community conversations. Uh, join us for those and continue to engage in this conversation because we all have roles to play in, in uh, the coming conversations and changes that we hope to see within the city of Flagstaff.